Good evening and welcome to another edition with uh, RUL Ministries with Mihai Kocha. We are in session four. And uh, again, what RUL stands for is Rediscovering Unchanging Love. Rediscovering Unchanging Love. Um, I'm the author of uh, Rediscovering Unchanging Love. Um, and this is my first book. I forgot to sec get the second one with me, uh, part two. There's a part two to this. This is part one. And um, I've shown it on previous uh, sessions. Um, and uh, what we are here to discuss is unprecedented material, unprecedented Bible truth, Bible studies, revolutionary studies that will... Wake everybody up. That's my hope and prayer, to uh, to wake people up, to uh, to get to know the Lord better in a better relationship, stronger, closer, and everlasting. Of course, everlasting relationship with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. Um, as I said, um, this ministry is about misunderstanding, discovering misunderstandings in the Word of God, truths that were neglected and obeyed because of our uh, sinfulness, because of our complacency. We think we have all the light, and in fact, um, we are just realizing that uh, we're barely scratching the surface. We do not know it all. The, uh, the presumption that we know it all is actually a big stumbling block in, uh, in the lives of all Christians. And that's what I'm here to, uh, to do, to convince everybody that there's so much more to discover and nobody should stop studying the Word of God like Jesus said, search the scriptures because in them you have eternal life. Eternal life. So the, as eternal life is eternal, uh, no limits, so is the word of God and his love. His unchanging love, no limits. You'll be surprised as I was to discover how much still is to discover how much there is yet to know about God's love and God's power, uh, his character. So I'm here to help you um, to be able to distinguish God out of all this confusion, out of all these voices, whisperings, uh, teachings, all these waves of knowledge, of spirituality, Good spirit, spirituality it could be wrong spirituality, and uh, to help us prepare for what is coming, um, as we said in our, in our first session, um, I discovered a, uh, a great awakening coming next year, twenty twenty three. So, uh, which means probably a great persecution. So um, I'm here to uh, prepare everyone to be able to withstand. Um, the storm, sure. Um, that's my, um, I hope that's my calling, and that's what I'm here to do. So let's continue. Uh, we are, um, last time we spoke about Moses, how some wrong teachings slipped through, and they were incorporated by his people, namely his prophets. And uh, we will continue to show about Elisha. Um, he's a very good example, Elisha and Elijah, but we're going to talk about Elisha today, who was Elijah's disciple. And uh, we will see that there's, there's more about Elisha that needs to be brought to light. And people neglected it. They thought this was actually an act of God that um, 
we will just we will talk about it very soon when in fact it is something else okay so pay attention so uh, <clears throat> one of these accounts about Elisha is found in um, 2 Kings chapter 5. It is about the encounter between Naaman the Syrian and Elisha. So 2 Kings chapter 5. Um, I'm not going to read the whole chapter. Uh, we'll just go through. Um, and I hope you guys are acquainted or if not, get acquainted with the chapter. 2 Kings chapter 5. So... Um, in this chapter, it described the miraculous healing of Naaman, a pagan from leprosy. He was uh, hit by leprosy, and he comes to Israel to be healed by Elijah. Well, to be healed, um, he found out that there's a prophet, and he wants to be healed by that prophet. Um, <clears throat> um, so he finds the prophet through the king, uh, the king sends him to Elisha, and Elisha is miraculously, miraculously healed by God through his prophet. And then Gehazi, his disciple, uh, he thought that his his master, Elisha, should have asked something in return. I mean, the man was healed from leprosy. I mean, he was destined to die, and now he is alive. He, he's alive and well. So I think he should pay something for that. And... Um, because it didn't cost him anything, Elisha thinks, you know, he could give something in return. And uh, <clears throat> so he decides to go after him, after Naaman, to ask for something that Naaman had plenty of anyway. So um, Naaman happily uh, gave Gehazi double what he asked for, and Gehazi returned to Elisha. Um, Little did Gehazi know that his master uh, knew the whole thing, exactly what happened, because Elisha saw uh, the whole thing actually in the vision, and as the, chap the chapter describes. And when Elisha asked him where he was, Gehazi lied to Elisha, and probably because he knew that what he did was wrong. I mean, that's why many people lie when they're asked about what they did, because they knew that there's something that they shouldn't have done. And in return, Elisha pronounced a curse upon him. And uh, he says that uh, Naaman's leprosy shall cleave unto him and to his seed forever. Uh, that's the curse that he pronounced. Now, if everything had remained the way it had been related until now, this passage would have been very easy to understand. Right? And there would be no confusion and misunderstandings. Gehazi sinned, and Elisha cursed him in the name of the Lord, and God punished him with leprosy, that according to the words of Elisha will never be healed. And that's what that's what the word says. It says, I shall cleave unto you and to, unto your seed forever. Uh, that's what verse 27 says. That's what it says, the leprosy, therefore Naaman shall cleave unto thee and unto thy seed forever. And he went out. From his presence, a leper as white as snow. All right, so therefore, now um, he is destined to die by the plague. Okay, but unfortunately, there's another passage that stands as a stumbling block. That stands as a stumbling block to the curse that Elisha pronounced upon Gehazi, and that passage is found in Second Kings chapter eight. From 1 to 5. Verse 1 to 5. So Second Second Kings chapter 8. From 1 to 5. And we will read this because it's not very long. And then it says. Then spake Elisha unto the woman. Whose son he had restored to life. Saying. Arise and go thou and thine household. And sojourn. Wheresoever thou canst sojourn. For the Lord hath, hath called for a famine. And it shall also come upon the land seven years. And the woman arose and did after the saying of the man of God. And she went with her household and sojourned in the land of the Philistines seven years. And it came to pass at the seven years end that the woman returned out of the land of uh, the Philistines. And she went forth to cry unto the king for her house and for her land. And the king talked with Gehazi, the servant of the man of God, saying, 
tell me, I pray thee, all the great things that Elisha had, hath done. And it came to pass, as he was telling the king, how he had restored a dead body to life, that, behold, the woman whose son he had restored to life cried to the king for a house and for his land. And Gehazi said, to my, said, My lord, O king, this is the woman, and this is her son, whom Elisha restored to life. So in this context, we see Gehazi talking to the king at least seven years later, if not more, because the lady um, goes to the into the land of Philistines and she returns after seven years. But who knows how long it took before the seven years? Do you see what I'm saying? Since Naaman was hit with leprosy, uh, since not Naaman, since uh, Gehazi was hit with leprosy, and between that time and the beginning of the seven years. So it could have been a little bit more than seven years. It could have been eight, nine, who knows? But at least seven years. So after seven years, uh, we see Gehazi, Elisha's disciple, in the king's castle, talking to the king. A leper in the king's house. Something is wrong here. Did the law change? I thought lepers were supposed to be away, secluded, separated from people. And 10 years, he probably should have been dead or close to that. What's he doing in the kid's house? Well, something tells me he was healed. And if he was healed, he was miraculously healed. Well, how can he be healed? Because Elisha, God's prophet, said that you will remain with leprosy forever. Leprosy shall, shall cling on you forever and to your seed. <clears throat> so something is wrong. So who healed him? Well, certainly not Elisha. Elisha told Gehazi that he'll die from leprosy. Yet we see that the Lord endured him and healed him. This means that the curse did not come from God, but from Elisha. Elisha pronounced it from himself. I'm not trying to say that Elisha is a false prophet, but that curse was neither pronounced nor approved by God. Do you see what I'm saying? Elisha is a man, just like you and me. And because of what he read in Moses, he's um, a little temperamental. He learned it from Elijah also. Remember Elijah? How he asked for the fire to come down to consume those people. Even the Lord showed it to him, you know, at Mount Horeb. He still didn't get it. He still didn't get it. Neither did Elisha. Remember the kids that he killed? Those uh, little children, 42 little children under the age of 12. He does it again. He does it again. <sighs> now, if not God, then who brought the leprosy upon Gehazi? Because it definitely happened through some supernatural power. So, do you see how quick Satan is in seeking opportunities? How quickly he brought confusion into the mind of Elisha and in the eyes of all who heard of and read this account. All those people who heard of this account and read it. Everybody reads and says, oh my God, what kind of God is this? But I'm telling you right now, that's not the kind of God we worship. Oh no. Just because his prophets make such mistakes doesn't mean that God approves them. And that's what I'm here to do. To enlighten you on this matter so you don't have to be afraid of God. Not anymore. <clears throat> We will keep going because Elisha has been rebuked before. 
Okay. When he resurrected the Shunammite son, remember the lady that uh, from chapter eight that comes back to ask for her land, whose son was restored to life. Uh, that account is found in Second Kings chapter four. Chapter four, from seventeen to thirty-seven. <clears throat> Uh, and again, we will not read the whole thing because I don't want to keep you for too long. Excuse me, but uh, so the the lady's son, uh, we call the Shunammite lady, the lady from Shunem. Uh, so the, the the child who was born miraculously also dies, and when he uh, when Eli Elisha hears of the child's death, he sent Gehazi to run before him and to lay his staff upon the face of the child. To the surprise of the prophet, nothing happened. Okay? The child was still dead. Gehazi told him, run ahead run ahead of us and uh, take my staff and put it upon um, uh, the face of the child. He thought the child was going to come back to life. To his surprise, the child was still dead. He went to the child's room and prayed this time. And after he prayed... He laid on top of the child and received a sign that God listened to his prayer by the warming of the child's body. So the child's body was getting a little warm, so he gets a sign. God still doesn't answer the prayer yet, but he revives hope in the heart of God's prophet. Um... He persisted this way, he continues, and only then did God resurrect the child. This was the lesson for Elisha that God is not a celestial room service, okay? That you can call upon by ringing a bell, to which you're supposed to, uh, supposed to answer promptly. You know, it's not like you go to a hotel room or to a restaurant and ring the bell and you supposed, yes, sir, what can I do for you? God doesn't do that. Yes, he's not, he's at the service, but he's not like uh, this kind of, this type of service. He's still a master. He serves as a master. Of course not. He had to insist, Elisha had to insist until he realized that God and God alone can make such a miracle. Elisha thought that since God gave him his power, this power, he can do with this power whatever he wanted. No, that was just a gift. Okay, God gave him the gift. But the gift is supposed to be used with God at his command, at his will. And knowing that we're not masters of that gift. We're just servants. Obedient servants. So man should never think that just because you, he received gifts from God, that from now on, man is the master of those gifts. The power still comes from God through those gifts. Exactly. Um, so that you should understand what kind of confusion existed among God's prophet in Israel. Not in Judah, but in Israel. We will pay attention to this next account, which is found in 1 Kings chapter 20. 1 Kings Chapter 20, because it's obvious that there's something going on among God's prophets. Why are they so temperamental? Yes, the teachings of Moses, yes, but the teachings of Moses were in Judah also. But this type of confusion, uh, this type of confusion was not so strong in Judah as it was in Israel. So there's something in Israel that has we have to focus on what happened. So it's it's in 1 Kings chapter 20 from verse 30 to 43. From 30 to 43. Um, again, I'm not going to read the whole thing. I, I don't want to make my sessions too long and boring. Uh, so, you know, I will let you get acquainted with the text. and But we will go over it little by little. So... Um, Let's let's continue. So King Ahab, it's about King Ahab, overcomes the Syrian king Ben Hadad, if you remember that account, and he lets him go, okay, despite God's commandment to kill him. God told him, 
I give him in your hands and you should kill him. In response to King Ahab's disobedience, because he let him go, the Lord sends a message to one of the sons of the prophets. Okay? The sons of the prophets were not literally sons of prophets, but it was just a title that they bear uh, symbolically, you know, just uh, a title that they used because the word prophets was um, a great name, just like Christians in the first in, in the first church. Um, same thing with the sons of prophets. They, they called themselves sons of prophets, but they were not literally sons of prophets. They were just a group of young men, um, and they were actually prophets. So <clears throat> this, young, this young man, after receiving the message from God, goes on to his neighbor, not another prophet, but someone close by, and demanded, to hit, uh, demanded of that neighbor to hit him. He went, hit me. This man refused to hit him, to hit him. And as a consequence for disobeying, disobeying the voice of the Lord, the young man tells him that a lion will meet him and kill him. His word is fulfilled, and the man who refused to hit the prophet for no reason was killed by a lion. Yeah, he says, um, verse 35, Smite me, I pray thee. And the man refused to, get, to smite him. Then said he unto him, Because thou hast not obeyed the voice of the Lord, behold, as soon as thou art departed from me, a lion shall slay thee. And as soon as he was departed from him, a lion found him and slew him. I hope you paid attention to this verse, to this account. Because if, didn't if this didn't surprise you, then you were not paying attention. Now, I'm going to ask you a question. Is this the kind of God we serve? The prophet, the young prophet, didn't even tell the man about his plan. Okay? He just told the man to hit him for no reason. He didn't tell him what the reason was, what the plan was. How can God give such a commandment? And then as a consequence for disobeying, disobeying an unreasonable command, God kills him. To me, this young prophet sounds like Elisha and Elijah. Through his words, he told his neighbors something like this. Because you have not obeyed my voice, which is like the voice of God, because I am a prophet. You will be killed in a miraculous way. But it will be too late for you to realize it. It will be too late. Don't you know who I am? Well, now you will know. Yeah. It wasn't God who told the young man that, he was, that his neighbor was going to be killed by a lion. No. Oh, no. It was pride. It was pride. And when there's pride, God is not there. And guess who looked for such opportunities to inflict fear in the hearts of all those who read this account? Oh my God. Everybody's scared to death. Everybody reads about this unreasonable command. Yeah, God told him about King Ahab. But to be hit, I'm not so sure. And then a lion's going to kill that man for an unreasonable command? It makes no sense to me. No sense to me whatsoever. Now, why do you think there was so much confusion and pride even among God's prophets? First of all, there was too much idolatry in Israel. But this shouldn't have been enough to cause that. Okay? Even if there's, a, there's idolatry in the world today, but that doesn't mean that we have to uh, succumb to that. Okay? There's no evidence that any of these prophets ever went to visit the temple in Jerusalem. It was mandatory for all men to go at least three times a year. Do you remember that? 
three times a year. It was Passover. It was the uh, the, um, the the feast of the weeks, uh, the Pentecost, and then it was the um, it was Rosh Hashanah for the um, feast of Tabernacles. At least three times a year, and then. You had to visit the temple when you were there. You you're supposed to bring sacrifices for yourself, for your sinfulness, you know, to show that you actually believe in salvation by the Messiah, which was supposed to come. No one could stand straight and walk upright without it, without fulfilling such a direct command. Jesus Jesus knew they had to visit the temple, and he did. So Jesus himself was not exempt from this. Okay? Elijah didn't. We have no evidence that Elijah ever visited the temple. And neither did Elisha or any of their followers. He didn't advise anybody to go to the temple, ever. I think this was the biggest problem. No one is exempt from obedience to God's word. Therefore, let us watch and pray so that we don't fall like them. We also have direct commands. <clears throat> we also have direct commands. The Ten Commandments. And the, uh, the belief in Jesus Christ. That Jesus is the Messiah, the Son of God, yes. So, I hope this um, cleared some of the misunderstandings. And I hope, little by little, you will get to see light in a better way. We'll see God in better light, through a better prism. So that our relationship could be established with God out of love, not out of fear. We don't want to approach God with shivering lips and shaking knees. Tell him how much we really love him when in fact we're scared to death of him. No. God knows exactly how you approach him. He doesn't want that. He wants worshipers to come close to him out of love. Out of love. So when you read such accounts, double check. Pray about it and double check. Because just like the devil was looking for opportunities through God's prophets, so he should look for opportunities through us too. If we are complacent, if we don't walk in the footsteps of Jesus, if we don't obey God's word and his command, so shall we. We will become they did maybe even worse because we have more light more responsibilities and he who has more of him shall be demanded more correct correct that's what jesus said so god bless you god help you thank you for watching thank you for listening and um until next time watch and pray god bless you all and uh, just a reminder again, um, if you need to purchase my books, you can do that at uh, uh, Amazon, Barnes & Noble, and other places, a lot of places, Walmart even sells, sells them, eBay, uh, and also uh, my website, uh, www.rediscoveringonchanginglove.com. You can even send me an email over there. Um, I look forward. You can purchase the book from there, the books. Um, you can e even read a little bit. It's a sample. You can read for free. And um, if you like it, please, by all means. So, yes, again, thank you. God bless you. Have a good night.